All right, I thought we would take a look at this lure. Unfortunately, I already did the design uh, before recording the video. But we can take a look at how I put it together and I can walk you through uh, what I did to get here. Uh, this is a lipped crank. This is the uh, swimming tadpole. So as it moves through the water, uh, the lip catches. We got a head shake and a little bit of wobble up and down. These joints right here articulate back and forth, uh, up and down a little bit, but mainly back and forth. And then I have a nice tip tail. There's the lip. Here's the through wire hole. Goes here, so you can imagine your wire comes down. You have your line tie right here. Your hook exits here, and you hang your hook about right there. So, started with see here I started with a oh, I started with the ice up here so this I'm gonna toggle on and off the parts that I'm talking about so you can see what I have so, this front piece which is the head we have an isosphere uh, that I just shaved out a little bit by moving the vertexes and let me select that and we'll go into edit mode so you can see the vertexes so I started with the isosphere, shaped that until I got the shape I wanted. Then I actually added in a cube when I was under the edit mode. And that what that does is combines these two objects together uh, and treats them like one object throughout the rest of the design. Uh, put in the cube, extended it, moved vertex. I used this function here, which is called loop cut. Um, and it allows you to cut your object into pieces if you want. So I took that cube and split it up in a few more uh, pieces. Gives me more vertexes to move around. Uh, and basically just work on shape. Um, the convenient thing, a uh, trick that I <laughs> should have known but didn't know, is there's a transform button here. And this allows you to select two objects by holding shift you select two objects, you switch to transform, and then you have all of these commands. So this rotate, uh, there's a scale, there's a distance, you can move things in all different directions. If you hold on a specific color, that will only move either rotate, scale, or uh, move in according to that axis. So if I, let's say I wanted to grab the green, and I want to fan these at both out to the left and right evenly, I can grab the green and fan them out, and fan them back in, and I can put them wherever I want, which is nice. It keeps your bait nice and even. I'm going to go ahead and undo that, control Z. Uh, so you can see it keeps everything nice and even. You can keep things centered. I always like to make sure I'm working on either the X or the Y axis just to make sure everything's centered and lined up. It's a lot easier when you originate your, or excuse me, when you add in your meshes of your different shapes, they all come in at the zero origin point. Uh, so by keeping on one of those axes, you can always make sure that you're staying on it. Uh, that being said, when you move stuff around, so let's say I put in a, let's get out of it mode object mode. Let's see, we add a, let's just add an isosphere. And then we're going to scale it up. You can either use this button or S. I like doing S, and then let's scale that up to like 15. Enter, that creates the object, so it sits there. When you want to move around, so this one I have lined up along the x-axis. If I want to move it around, you grab that x-axis, it won't move side to side. It will only move up and down the x-axis. And like I said, that allows you to make sure your bait's actually aligned right. Nothing's going to be off to the side. Uh, you start making stuff off to the side, you're going to end up with a bait that curves off to the side. Or a lure that curves off to the side. So let's go ahead and delete that object. Alright, so that was the isosphere. So that's the head and the lip. Now the next portion is getting articulation. This is always tricky to figure out how you need to make sure to print in order to have articulation afterwards. So the main problem is that you always have supports that print out. You can't just print 
you can't 3D print an object just in the air. It needs to have something to build off of. Uh, so you need to keep in mind that you're going to have some supports. So what I like to do, let me turn off one of these. Let me figure out which one it is. So I think it's a cube. Okay. So what I like to do when I want side to side is I have a cylinder coming out of the object in the back that goes into a socket. And if I only want side to side, I don't use a ball, but I use another cylinder that's up and down. So what this will allow is for movement side to side, but very little movement up and down. And in my cube, let me turn that back on, in my cube I have the same setup as a hole. So I have a cylinder, you can see the cut right here, let me zoom in on this one. So you can see I have a cut cylinder here, but I also have a cut cylinder around there that doesn't go all the way through the object because then you'd have a hole all the way through but it stops part way in and let's see here so let me figure out which cube that is okay so cube one so I just disappeared cube one you see this this object this slightly bigger cylinder is the one that I have to be programmed in to be, not be printed so it creates an airspace in between the cube in between the cube that sits around here and this smaller cylinder inside which acts as your ball. And the way that I do that is you select an object, you go to this blue modifier properties, click on that when you first uh, bring this up and you haven't added any these won't be listed but you come in and add modifier I always add a boolean or bolean not sure how to say that but you add this that will bring up the this little square this blue highlighted square here uh, so I actually have two of them one for the cylinder that goes out one for the cylinder that the socket is in uh, so you come down and you select which object you want there to be a hole so we have this action is going to get rid of the difference of the object that you have selected, which in this case is Q, and whichever cylinder you select. So in this case, if you want to do multiple cylinders, which I did, I went through, added this modifier, and then I came back again and added this modifier for cylinder 7. So as we can see, cylinder 7 is this cylinder here so that's what creates my cavity or that's what creates my cavity in and out So that creates that cylinder right there. Um, now basically I just duplicated that joint in both this object and this object. Uh, my original design I also had a fourth nodule out here, but when printing out the size that I wanted um, by stepping it down it ended up being too small. I mean that's something you got to keep an eye on and unfortunately you don't know until you start printing it out uh, is what sizing this articulation is still going to perform in. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is this is a very weak spot. This cylinder and this cylinder here, those will create weak spots just because there's not a lot of plastic connecting those two. Uh, that's why we go with a through wire design that has a solid wire here. So in theory, the only thing this is getting hit on is if you cast it into a log or a uh, fish happens to bite this, but there's a lot of pull strength. It's just side to side strength that you're kind of missing. Um, I think I had one break on me while I was fishing and I uh, had was running in a river over rocks repeatedly and then I finally broke a tail end off but uh, but the good news about 3d printing is that you can just go print yourself another one and you have another one ready to go basically so that's how I designed this one uh, 
I will sh jump over now to our slicer and I will show you how I slice this one up just to make for efficient printing and to make sure that we have minimal support so that articulation actually works. Alright, so now we have my STL file that I created um, exported and now I brought it into my Ultimate Akira. Uh, as you can see, it's fairly large. Let's see, we're looking at from um, about the edge of the lip there to the tail, we're looking at about 114 millimeters, uh, which is a pretty substantial uh, bait. It, well within what a largemouth bass will bite, but if you're looking for other stuff, you can always shrink these down. I believe the smallest I have gotten my printer to work on and still be reliable is about 55% scale. So we're going to drop this down to 55. 55, as you can see that dropped it. Uh, actually, over half. No, sorry. Uh, as you can see that dropped it to about 63 millimeters, which is a much more reasonable size. Um, it's about the normal length of a, any normal size crankbait, about. So, the things we gotta keep in mind are you'll always have this through wire hole that's going to want supports unless you have it vertical. So, in most cases, you'd want to set this up so this is vertical. But the other thing we need to think about in this case, this lure's case, is we need this articulation to work. And remember, the design we have have the cylinders going up and down. So, what we'd want is the supports to be either printed on the, the very, oh, well, they'll be printed on the bottom of the cylinder, whichever way direction we print it. We want just one contact right on the bottom of the cylinder, and then it could build the cylinder from there. Then it'll leave an airspace, or maybe uh, there might be slight support for the top of the roof, but if anything, we're looking at supports just on the very edges of the cylinder, so that way there's a better chance that it will break freely without breaking your your little axis that comes out. So in order to do that we either want to print it in this orientation that it sits or we want to rotate it 180 degrees so it's laying on its back. Uh, only difference between those two printing wise is going to be where your supports are sitting. So as you can see all this red that's underneath here, all of that is going to have uh, supports printed out and actually pretty substantial supports as well. I can go ahead and slice it and show you. Alright, we're in a preview. Okay, so what we're looking at here is how the, the G-code is going to perform. So, the yellow and the red and the green are all different layers uh, that are actually part of the object. And as you go down through, you'll see that we have uh, another color orange that comes in, and that is your infill which can be manipulated, I'll show you in a little bit. So, the parts that we're concerned with if we're trying to minimize supports are these blue. Now you'll always have this br this outline blue brimming and that just kind of cleans off your uh, extruder. Uh, it goes around every object. I'm not worried about that, it doesn't use much plastic, doesn't take much time. Uh, but what you do need to worry about is all of this light blue down here. So we're looking, there's the infill in the orange come down and now we're all of this blue and that slightly dark blue is all going to be supports that are printed. That's a pretty significant amount for this small of a piece. So if we look, it's an estimated hour and 14 print time with 6 grams. Um, let's go ahead and rotate it and see if that changes and visually if the supports look a lot better. So we rotate it 180 degrees, we slice it again. dropped out three minutes, still about the same uh, usage of uh, usage of PLA, sorry, I was thinking of which plastic I was using, uh, but the supports are a little bit different this time, so now we have more supports here on the lip, and less supports under here, so it's a toss-up, this one's slightly shorter, 
and I would say to go with this one um, in general. It probably wouldn't hurt you to do the other way. Just any time that I see the time a little less, it's going to save you a little bit of PLA that might add up to be an extra lure. Uh, these don't take a lot of PLA. I'm still working through my first couple of rolls at this point. Uh, so let's take a look. So as of right now, you print this out, it would be a functioning lure. The only problem is when you print it out, this support right here is going through that through wire hole. Now because we're worried about these cylinders, let me roll down, since we're worried about these two cylinders printing out and being freely, we really want them to print in this direction because if you don't, you'll end up with supports connecting here, supports connecting here, um, and then you'll have weak zones because if you print out in this direction, you'll have fractures through here. Whereas if you're printing, oops, sorry. Whereas if you're printing this way, the long axis is supported by those long strands of plastic. It just makes it a lot stronger in these axis points. So if that's what we're looking at, this is pretty minimal. You can get out with a drill. Sometimes they break out with a pick. Uh, it's really not that big of a problem, especially when you have a short one. If you were doing a longer one, or you wanted it to rotate around, uh, rotate around the through hole, then you might want to print it so it doesn't print supports in there, because that can cause catches and everything else. Uh, but for this one, we're just probably just going to drill a hole through and clear this out, and then super super glue in the through wire so it doesn't rotate. And the next thing I want to show you is. And I'm sure there's a more efficient way to do this, but I don't want this thing to float in the water as high as it's going to float. As you can see, all of this infill, all of that orange, and then all of these spaces are all going to be air spaces in between the orange. Uh, right now it's set to 20% of infill, which is right up here. Um, I believe PLA has a density of like 1.2, 1.25. Which is denser than water, so if you print it out solid, it's going to sink. Uh, especially, don't forget that you're adding a through wire and a hook and a line tie and possibly a snap ring on there. Uh, so you're going to have weight. So, what I like to do is if you want something to sink, I put it about at 80 because by the time you add all your hardware, it's probably going to sink pretty steady, but not sink to the crown or sink to the bottom of whatever you're fishing. But if you want it to float, you can do 20%, but the other thing I like to do is split the infill. By splitting the infill, it allows me to make this area really dense, yet have floating capability up the top. So if I set this upright and do, uh, I'll probably bring it down to about right here and just do the head heavy, just down here, there's probably solid plastic through here. Uh, what that'll do is allow this lure to float when you cast it in which gives you time to just set up and start reeling. Um, you don't have to worry about it catching. If you need to slow down and let it float to the surface, it can. Uh, but then once you start cranking, it dives to appropriate depth. It's not just sitting at the surface wobbling. So let's go ahead and add a support blocker. And like I said, there's probably a better way to do this. I don't really know. This is how I always do it. So we select the support blocker, make sure you're on an eraser. And we're going to increase the size. Always hit uh, uniform scaling off. I'm going to extend it in X. Extend it there a little bit. I'm going to turn and look, see what we got. And that should be enough. And then we're going to move. I always like moving the arrows. I like to move the axis because it, sometimes it's very hard to get stuff to move properly without using the axis points. Uh, and you can see my through wire is shaded out through there. I'm going to want that back a little bit, so let's switch the scale. And that should be good. I need to bump it a little bit. You can see that the lip is sticking out just the slightest bit. Okay, let me go here, and then we're going to go to per model settings going to come in. Now this is a support blocker, so this wouldn't support anything, but that's not really what we're after. What we're after is this overlays. We're going to go to select settings, to infill density. 
and then we're going to close this window, come down, and we're going to say 100. So what this will do is anywhere that this object is over, or sorry, anywhere that this square, which is our eraser right now, but it will be a modifier, overlaps the object that we selected, it's going to print a density of 100%. This works in a percent if you can't see that gray. So what that will do is this will be solid plastic everywhere through here, anywhere that it overlaps. Then the rest of it will be printed as 20% infill, uh, and that will allow airspace and that will float um, and it will sit in the water a lot better. Let me exit here and then I'll slice it can see and make sure that all of our spaces are not overlapped. You slice it and you see it added four minutes to our time <clears throat> and that's because these are no longer going to be infilled. It's just more plastic to lay down. Well, let's take a look at what it looks like. <clears throat> now you'll notice as we go through, now look at that orange. It's stacked one after another after another after another. So what you're going to end up with solid layers all the way through here. These are all solid layers. So this will be a solid layer plastic, solid layer plastic, all the way down until we get to where our support blocker stops. Oh, actually here's a good view of where it changes. So here's the edge of my support blocker. This is solid plastic. This is playing out as 20% infill. As we come down, come down some more, there's the switch. So this is going to switch over to 20% infill. Now remember we flipped this upside down. So when we flipped it upside down, for now we're remember to print the your lip and then the bottom half of your head. Now remember we flipped it upside down, so the way it is is on the top, but when you're printing it's going to turn out as the lip and the bottom half of the head are all 100%. Let me give you a slow little view, so this will give you a good idea of how it's going to print every slice. Now we'll come to that point, start printing solid, solid, solid all the way up, and then point. Um, so we should be all set from here. You can save to your disk and then transfer it over to your printer and start printing it out. There's not much else to this one. Um, I will say, just in general, I do most of my lips as solid plastic. <clears throat> it's less chance of breakage, a little bit stronger. You're relying on bed, the whole adhesion for the layer. You're not just relying on the adhesion from the outside. Uh, plus the lips usually on the bottom, which is not a bad place to have some density and have some weight. Um, it'd be similar to like making a wood lure and putting lead or something heavier in the bottom. Um, which kind of weights it and sets it right in the water. So that's how that one works, and we'll get it printed out and check out how it works in the water. Since this video is running a little long, I'll go ahead and just show you some pictures. Uh, white bass and a largemouth that I've caught. Um, that day that I caught the white bass, I actually caught five of them about that size in that area. This lure ended up working quite well, and hopefully I can catch some more fish and 
maybe catch a few on video that I can upload or at a later time. Thanks for watching and hopefully you can join me for the next lure.